Hi everyone, I'm Bartu Kaligasi uh, with the Center for Space Governance. Uh, we're a research institute that uh, focuses on the space economy and its policy implications. And today I'm gonna be talking about commercial space stations. Um, so for decades, space stations were uh, a platform for international collaboration and scientific advancement, you know, starting with the Apollo-Soyuz handshake, Mir Space Station, Skylab, many generations of that, and we ended up with this beautiful platform called the ISS. And you know, today it serves as uh, infrastructure for uh, astronauts, for things like spacewalks, research, microgravity research, uh, research into biology, what kind of food we can grow in space, um, what kind of conditions humans can survive, and that is all really important for our future um, in orbit, but also on the moon, on Mars, and beyond. However, soon it is going to be deorbited. And you know, SpaceX has been um, potentially um, uh, selected there to, <laughs> to get rid of the ISS for us. It's not gonna be quite so dramatic, but essentially you know, deorbit it. And uh, now we we're, gonna, we're gonna have a gap. We're gonna have this gap of platforms where we can have astronauts in space, we can have commercial activities, scientific experiments, all of that. However, NASA comes to the rescue partially. So they wanna advance a lot of their funding away from LEO towards um, towards the moon, towards Mars, towards more deep space uh, missions and science. And so they started the CLD program, Commercial Leo Destinations. And this is essentially funding um, commercial players uh, from the US with some partnerships uh, across with Europe uh, to develop those next commercial platforms, commercial space stations that will succeed the ISS, uh, ideally before it gets deorbited in around 2030, 2031. And so um, that is also coupled with uh, future anticipation of launch capacity increasing. So we've got Starship that's gonna be able to launch a lot more um, mass to orbit, hopefully at a lower price as well. Costs are definitely gonna go down. Um, and so that's gonna open up new avenues for what kinds of modules, what kinds of infrastructure we can launch and assemble in orbit. So that's all really exciting. So there are a few candidates that have been funded so far that seem like they are on track to be able to build commercial space stations. The most prominent probably is Axiom Space. Um, and so Axiom Station is going to start off as a module attached to the ISS. It is then going to expand with additional um, modules that, um, that attach themselves to that and eventually float free from the ISS before it gets deorbited and become this large commercial space station. And Axiom already has some heritage. It's been flying kind of missions to the ISS and stuff. So we have reason to believe that this project will probably come to fruition if the funding uh, doesn't dry out. Um, the second prominent project is Starlab. So this is a uh, cooperation between Voyager Space and newly a joint venture with Airbus, which is very interesting because it makes it more of a transatlantic initiative. Uh, so for the first time there, you have a CLD project that could potentially involve significant European um, participation. I think it is technically with Airbus's US um, uh, subsidiary, but there has been a lot of talks with ESA and with the European Commission on how we can make sure that Europe maintains access to space and how we can continue diversifying that access uh, to uh, more types of actors, more types of nations, uh, private actors, citizens, all of that. And actually an interesting thing about Starlab is that it can potentially launch in one single launch with a Starship. So the plan is to just get it all up in one go limited assembly, um, and so that's uh, a relatively kind of simple architecture which uh, will be interesting to see. A more complex project, which has gone through some rocky, um, uh, rocky times, but is still kind of looking like it's progressing, is Orbital Reef. So this is a partnership between Blue Origin and Sierra Space. They essentially want to build the first business park in orbit. So multi-purpose, you have um, space that is for commercial uh, use, you have a lot of astronaut space, experimental space. Um, and so this is gonna be interesting if it, if it uh, uh, can uh, come to reality because you're gonna have a lot of different types of activities coexisting and we're going to have to deal with a lot of these challenges, especially in terms of governance, of what happens when you have uh, you know, astronauts and uh, potentially commercial um, astronauts and other kind of private uh, uh, actors all coexisting in this one space, what does that look like for, you know, there are many questions around like liability and safety and all of that. So these are all challenges that we're gonna have to tackle and these CLDs are pushing us to start thinking about that. Um, another interesting one, which hasn't, uh, if I'm not mistaken, been funded yet by CLD, but will apply for the next round is Haven One. So this is by the company Vast, uh, which was uh, founded by uh, Jed McCaleb, a crypto 
um, entrepreneur. So this is completely privately funded at the moment. And they are hoping to launch next year. So this is coming really soon. Uh, and they're hoping to launch this in just one Falcon 9 rocket. Um, so very simple architecture, obviously a much smaller station, but immediately proving whether these commercial platforms can make it technologically and whether they can sustain enough of that funding and revenue uh, to be able to survive without the government uh, propping them up. And in this case, it looks uh, very likely because it's you know, entirely privately funded. It could benefit from future uh, venture capital if needed uh, and so forth. And then Deep Space Nine, but that's, that's more aspirational. That one may take a few hundred more years, but I wanted to put it up there. It's not commercial, but you know, I want something like this to exist eventually. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so what does this open up in terms of the in-space economy? Well, you have a lot of uh, different activities that are already planned and have different commercial incentives in orbit. Um, but the existence of these commercial platforms can both act as a catalyzer for uh, the push that is needed for these in-orbit activities to uh, actually start kicking off and have that commercial demand, but also as a platform potentially for launching certain things from the space station, like the ISS has been used to deploy CubeSats in the past. You could do similarly uh, things, like the, things like that for um, uh, technology demonstrations, for example, uh, for these kinds of platforms. And just generally having more commercial activities in space fosters an ecosystem. It fosters the need for things like refueling, space debris removal. Space debris removal becomes even more important if you have these large commercial space stations uh, floating around in orbit. And so all of this gets catalyzed. Uh, so you can see things like VARDA, you know, uh, developing drugs in space. Um, you have potentially space-based solar power on the top right, orbit fab gas stations on the bottom left, and something potentially even like uh, hotels in space um, uh, someday. Um, so I'll go quickly through some opportunities and challenges here. Uh, human space flight, we mentioned it could be a, a platform to train uh, for the moon and Mars as well. Um, international cooperation, Voyager's uh, joint venture with Airbus setting the foundations there potentially. Uh, microgravity research in bio, pharma, um, material science. Uh, you have uh, that in-space economy a component that I mentioned, uh, both from an R&D and from a manufacturing and in-orbit assembly um, perspective. And then space tourism, um, which you know I'm sure will be very cool to have hotels in space. We'd all enjoy to go up and see the Earth uh, from above. Um, but then there are also a lot of challenges, and this is something that I worked on recently this year. Um, so in terms of funding, you know that dependence on the NASA CLD program, something to uh, avoid moving forward. Uh, how can we make them? commercially sustainable? Do they need venture capital funding? Can they find those revenue streams? Um, that takes us down to the business model side. Can we identify those use cases that will have an actual sustainable business model that will have those revenue streams coming in from a diversity of customers and not be putting all their eggs in one basket, uh, like just NASA astronaut contracts? A lot of technological challenges, of course. Um, life support systems, uh, assembly for those that need it, uh, the docking of things like uh, the Dream Chaser for Orbital Reef. Uh, you know, space plane that's going to go up. Uh, how is that going to work? Is it even going to be ready in time? And then VAST actually plans to have artificial gravity stations. So that's kind of a, a new uh, frontier there that will be explored uh, and will be interesting to see uh, whether they can succeed with that uh, within this decade. Um, then there are governance and regulation issues. Um, so mission authorization, something that's been discussed for a while now. Is it going to be in commerce? Is it going to be commerce and transportation? Uh, how does the FAA play into that? How do they coordinate? And this is really important for uh, authorizing large projects like CLDs. Uh, a lot of regulatory issues, um, insurance for these CLDs. Is there a cap? Uh, are commercial space stations included? Um, liability. Um, is there some kind of intergovernmental agreement um, between different nations and actors for commercial space stations? If something happens, something gets damaged, someone gets hurt. Um, and then ITAR, which you know, needs to be reformed one way or another, but um, that is uh, probably one of the less likely ones. Um, and then geopolitically, there's an interesting dimension there. Uh, you have uh, these three kind of commercial, three to four commercial space stations by US companies that are going to be in this uh, separate block from China's Tiangong space station. And then in parallel to that, the Artemis program and China's uh, international lunar research station together with Russia. So you have these geopolitical um, dynamics at play there. Uh, this is a project that I worked on uh, while I was at Columbia with the State Department. And so we essentially came up with these 12 high-level recommendations. I won't go through all of them in the interest of time, but happy to discuss it later. Uh, essentially trying to streamline those processes of governance regulation and making sure that the business case is sustainable, that these things are not going to be dependent on NASA funding after they have launched. Um, and then finally, it's worth thinking about what that future looks like if we can start developing commercial uh, platforms in space. Can we start developing larger and larger infrastructure and if eventually get to a point where we have actual 
places in space that we are going to and doing things in that vision that uh, Blue Origin has, essentially. Thank you. Thanks.